Hi guys, um, nice to see you here. My name is Holger Putin from London Institute of Photography. And um, the, uh, I'm really excited to have um, Laura here for our talk tonight. Um, but before I hand this over to you, Laura, I just really quickly want to introduce our school and our um, LRP talks. Let me quickly share my screen with you. So you can see on, this is our uh, webpage, it's lirp.co.uk. And so apart, as a photography school, apart from uh, offering different types of courses, we also have our LIRP talks, which now over the years have grown to a really amazing uh, archive of different photography related talks. That means it's not only just photographers, but we have, for example, we had Costas, food stylist, we had Tim Barber, a lifestyle photographer, but we also have agents coming in, we had the famous Ted Forbes coming in, Amy Twigger, the food photographer twice in a year, we had agents coming in, and you will also find the talk with Laura tonight uh, on our webpage, this usually takes us a few days, but I just really want to point you into the right direction. All right, Laura, um, Nice to have you here tonight. Um, so just to warn you, everyone, although this actually looks like it's actually a recording, so that means um, there's no option, unfortunately, to ask any questions. But I will definitely have a few questions for you, Laura. Uh, I know, know your work uh, pretty well. I'm a really big fan of this. So um, I hope you don't mind me asking any sort of related questions. No, uh, please feel just, free. You know, ask away. <laughs> Super, I'm going to hand this over to you. Um, I think there's a one second. Okay, we should be good. All right, it's all yours, Laura. Nice Hi, to have you here you. tonight. Uh, well, thank you so much for asking me. It's very um, flattering and it's always a pleasure talking to other photographers and um, yeah, exciting to talk to lots of potentially new photographers and people with varying amounts of experience. Um, I suppose a little bit about me before we get started. My name is Laura Lewis. I live in London. Um, I'm a documentary portrait, sorry, portrait documentary and lifestyle photographer. Um, and I have been freelance for about 10 years. Um, and before that, I how, how I got into photography, I um, I graduated from art school. I went to the Norwich School of Art and Design. Um, I didn't actually study photography. I studied creative and cultural studies, but I, I did some photography during that time. Um, and I learned to use a camera, importantly, um, and the dark room. And um, a lot of my work was centered around photography and video work. And I graduated in 2005 and moved to London. Um, I actually started working client side. I used to work in music videos and I started as an assistant um, in a music video department at a major record label. I always had a very big interest in music um, and it sort of steered me along the way. And that's why in the early days of my photography, a lot of my stuff was music based. I've sort of branched out a little bit more these days. Um, the areas that I photograph in, I, I, I do commercial work, stuff that I'm paid for. Um, I work for record labels and um, I do editorial stuff, people like The Guardian. Um, I work for theatre companies um, and I also do stuff for charities and for individual companies. I also do corporate work, um, as in headshots for corporations. Um, and then I also do my personal work as well, which I think is very important. Um, and some of that I'm going to touch on today. So that gives you a kind of a, a, a spectrum of, of what I do. And today I would like to talk to everybody about vulnerability in photography. Um, and I feel very vulnerable sat here doing this. So this is, <laughs> this is my talk. It's a very meta thing to be doing. Um, and yeah, I think I've always been very interested as my career has gone on and on, my thoughts and feelings towards photography has changed, has altered as, as we do, as we get older and, and you know, everything changes a little bit along the way. And something that I've become very aware of in the last few years, certainly, is that um, 
the notion of vulnerability is something that comes up time and time again and um, some people watching this might be familiar with um, uh, a person who, named Brené Brown she's very famous and she talks a lot about vulnerability and how that can help you and it's a scary thing to do and it's a scary thing to be um, I'm just going to quote her here she describes vulnerability as uncertainty risk and emotional exposure um, and she goes on to say that it's the feeling sorry the that unstable feeling we get when we step out of our comfort zone or do something that forces us to loosen control so in the early days of photography I didn't think any of that I was just like let's take shots and let's try and control everything and you know to a certain extent that is photography we have a camera we need to control the settings on it we have a certain modicum of control over what is in front of us we can choose to go to places so you would think possibly that going to take a photo or doing a photo sheet is all about control and what I think I've learned over the years is the exact opposite almost the exact opposite um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today um, yeah can I ask uh, Laura the mm. For example, when I was a young photographer, the, my, my biggest aim was to, uh, to be able to control the process, to control yeah. the camera, to control the environment, to control the lighting. Mm -hmm. And that was the most exciting bit, the, to ultimately be able to control. And then once you have achieved this, then the control or the element of control gets really boring because ultimately you really need to wow yourself. You need to excite yourself. You need to surprise yourself and control is like the opposite that means there's no surprise everything is going to go exactly like the way you planned yeah. do you also feel like that that when the the more experience you have you kind of fashion in elements or uncontrollable elements or elements of i don't know just like randomness or chaos yeah in your photo shoots yeah absolutely so i think these days, I was talking about on another podcast about this randomly, but I think anything creative um, where you need to, you need to believe, you need to believe what you do has purpose. Like, sure, I could turn up to a photo shoot. I could control absolutely everything. I could have pre-existing ideas. I could put this person in front of this camera and I could use this lighting. And that was the idea that I had. And yet it could come out fine. It really could. But I think what is a more accurate way of describing my process now is that you can prepare. So you can have ideas, create a mood board perhaps, like with portrait clients, I might sit and work out some ideas like, do you like this? Do you like that? And try and work out what's in their heads and tell them what's possible for me to be able to give to them. So we've already got a visual language that we're talking about, but it's not the exact thing. We can agree on a location, for example, and I could go and do a recce and I could go and find, there's a street that we want to do a photograph on. Brilliant. I could go there the day before and I can go and have a look and I have a good idea and I could show those pictures to the client before we do it and be like, this is where we're thinking about shooting. I can prepare my cameras, my actual technology. I can get everything charged. I can clean the lenses. I can make sure things are working. Batteries are all in and you know everything's functioning. That's the preparation. I can get a good night's sleep. That's preparation. I can make sure that I'm well nourished. I've had a breakfast. So I'm running on a full tank, things like that. Really important, staying hydrated. Just all those little tiny things that help you function because we're doing a physical job at the end of the day and um, as well as doing something creative. On the day when we turn up, that's the part that you have the least control over. And I think that's where the magic comes in a little bit because if I was to turn up to a shoot perhaps with you and say right we're going to do this 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 the street's ready the lighting's good go nobody's going to enjoy that but if I arrive and say hey you know and have a bit of a conversation and say right we've got this we've got that how do you feel about approaching it with this location first mm -hmm. I don't have control over what that person's going to say 
but I'm, it's a collaboration and so we're sort of having a dialogue. And throughout the day as you're photographing, it's more of a dialogue rather than me controlling everything. It's feeding back against each other, having empathy for the person opposite you. And sometimes that means things like, if you turn up to a shoot and somebody's not feeling well, like they, a good example, hey, I've got an example, should we go to my website? <laughs> um, this is where I have to share a screen. I'm hoping I'm not gonna share all my innermost secrets in my emails. Here we go. Which one is it? It's desktop do. Okay, so you should be able to see my website. Can you see it? Okay, perfect. So, hi, welcome to my website. Um, talking about people that weren't feeling very well. So this guy here, some people will recognize. Can you see him? That's Rod Stewart right there. And he is um, the picture person for my portrait um, portfolio. So if we click in, here he is. So this is somebody who I photographed um, for a record label. It was actually a behind the scenes photograph and he was doing a music video that day. And as I said before, I've done quite a few things with record labels over the years. Rod was really unwell that day, like super unwell. Like he had, I can't remember what it was, but he turned up to the shoot and we were meant to do a, a third day video shoot the next day. And it actually all got canceled because he was, stuff, you know, he was so under the weather and he was really poorly. If I'd just gone up to him and said, right, I've got this idea and just gone better, 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 better. Yeah, I'm not gonna end up working with him again or, you know, so I had ideas. I'd, I'd already turned up to the to the um, the place where he was doing his music um, video. Um, had a few ideas about where I could photograph him when he turned up. I had about three minutes to get some shots with him. Not much longer. We happened to be in a lovely place that had a lovely window, had a beautiful light, and I said to him, you know, we'd worked with each other one or two times before, but we. You know, he's a very famous person. I didn't want to, sometimes you just come to people with a small amount of conversation. And I just very quickly said, how are you today? And he told me how unwell he was. So that's when you have to rejig and recalibrate your ideas of what you want to do and you have to make it work for the other person as well. And you sort of have to break down those barriers of him not feeling very well whilst holding boundaries basically which is quite a hard thing to do, especially when you've got a camera in your hands and you're trying to like, oh, I've, I've got a camera and I've got to find all the right settings and the, control the parts that you can do. And so the way that it worked out was, he said he wasn't very well. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. Can I just take, you know, is, are you still okay to have a few pictures? And he said, yeah, a few. We fired off maybe, I don't know, 40 frames. I would I have to look back, but we, we didn't have very long. And it just so happened that one of them captured him. And when you know, like the backstory, you can see how on you can see that he feels tired and he feels unwell. But you kind of don't know that um, from the picture necessarily. It might just be that he's having a minute to himself, and it's kind of in in the style that I take portraits. Um, so my point being, being vulnerable with people. You sort of also have to make choices that are in line with your values as a human being and that's where you not having control over situations can really come into play um, we need to make connections with people we photograph um, but we also need to be very aware that we if we're dealing with people and we're photographing people that people are three-dimensional creatures four dimensional you know five-dimensional creatures they're not just two dimensional things that we want to get the best possible picture out of. And we're dealing with people's bodies. Mm. So interesting that you're saying that because I think the perception of most people is that the, the better the, photogra uh, the uh, photographer, the, the more control they have. So literally like everything has been, um, has been defined. Everything has been spelled out. The better they are, the more control they have over the photo shoot, and everything works exactly as planned. And um, I'm sure a lot of the our listeners are really delighted to hear that ultimately this is element of this is human or emotional element, and there's an element of improvisation, yeah, where you need to 
uh, where, you, where you need to react to whatever, however the situation is going to play out. Yeah. Uh, can you show us some, some more pictures? Uh, yeah, sure. So, let's have a look. Mm -hmm. so let's talk about, it's a good one to talk about in terms of vulnerability. So I'm just going to go into my portrait. Have I stopped sharing the screen? I need to come back to the screen, don't I? Okay, hang on two seconds. All right, here we go. This is me having no control over a situation, i.e. my computer. This is the magic. <laughs> here we go. All right. So here we go. This is um, an image of Will Young and Christopher Sweeney. So this image won Portrait of Britain in, was one of the winners of Portrait of Britain in 2018. Um, and I think, yeah, we'll talk about um, awards and how that is a vulnerable act in itself, entering awards in a little while. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about how this image came, came about in terms of vulnerability. So um, Will Young and Christopher Sweeney are um, they're friends of each other and many people will know Will Young and quite a few people might know Christopher Sweeney. He's a TV director as well. And they did a podcast called Homo Sapiens, which was um, a podcast and still is a podcast that focuses on LGBTQ um, issues and interviews lots of people in, in the LGBTQ world. Um, and Chris and I had worked on a music video again together years before and they needed an image for their podcast um, and he came to me and said you know we've got a couple of ideas one of their ideas was the um, there's a famous Tim Walker um, shot of him in bed surrounded by lots of things um, and also Grey Gardens came up which if, if for anyone who has seen the Grey Gardens documentary um, you'll start to get the references in, in this image. Um, I can send links to the end of this. I really recommend watching Grey Gardens as a documentary just because it's really cool. Um, but yeah so we had some ideas um, but we needed to turn up and we needed a shoot to happen. I'd never been to Will's house before. We, this was shot in Will's actual bed in Will's actual bedroom. It's Will's actual dog and tea. And, you know, this is all his own kind of life, basically. Um, and so, yeah, when you show up to a portrait shoot where you have a few bits of ideas, you have to kind of piece them together as you arrive, whilst being creative, whilst having a kind of calm and stillness about yourself. Um, and going back to what you said about, you know, people thinking that all the best photographers shoots are all just like, you know, perfectly run. There is a certain element of that, but sometimes, and I think maybe you might identify and hopefully other people will, it's sometimes like we're swans on the surface. We're like swimming along, looking very graceful. And underneath our little legs are kicking like this. <laughs> and we're thinking about a hundred thoughts a second about what's the light looking like in here. Is there a possibility that we might have time to do that? Is their outfit okay? Have I got the right camera? Have I got the right lens? There's, you know, a lot of things going on at the same time. Um, so yeah, it was a really nice shoot to do this um, and we, do, we got quite a few things throughout um, their house but I think the, one, the reason that they ended up on this one and perhaps why it won Portrait of Britain is purely because there's an element of vulnerability you've got two guys sat in bed together in Will's actual bedroom you know and he's sort of a you know a well-known personality there's a dog there it feels very homely um, and it doesn't feel, hopefully, like I've just bust in and said, right, let's shoot some pictures, go. There's been a bit of a lead up to it. And there's been some calmness and some stillness. We've had a bit of laughter and a bit of sort of, you know, back and forth and a dialogue. And we've arrived at that image because of the sort of steps that we've taken in that dialogue to get to that moment. Um, whilst being a bit daring, you know, I think it probably was, a few, there was a few things in the room that I, they just weren't going to fit into the picture. So as I was taking them, I sort of had to say, is it okay if I move some things around in your bedroom? I often joke with clients that part of my life, part of my career is just walking to people's houses and moving their stuff around. Right? Yeah. I was wondering if you had rearranged something. So um, 
my experience, really often the our imagination of a space is very different to the actual condition. Absolutely. So usually we need to almost kind of, you know, like superimpose, really, we really need to uh, act out our vision of a place to really make it look as if it would be just a plain space. Because normally it just things are just a tiny bit too messy, right? Oh, absolutely. And like, yeah, you can, you can often walk into a space and you can, you can see you can see the possibilities, but you also know you're going to have to ask that person to really, you know, tweak things. Most people are open to it, most people. And some people won't be, and in which case you've got to really let go of your idea and let go of control of that, because the moment that you start annoying people, you're not going to get really vulnerable portraits. You're going to get, you're going to get glass eyes where people are like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, let me know, so the, the screen sharing has stopped. Oh, sorry, that's probably my fault. Hang on, let's go back. No, I'm going to remind you every time the, the screen share has stopped. Okay. Okay. Let's go back. All right, so shall we go and have a look at another picture? Oh, great, um, yeah. So, um, I'm quite tempted to take you into this one. Here we go. So, this is more of my sort of more documentary. This is the more kind of art end, I guess, of what I do. Um, I like to call it documentary, but I suppose it also falls into interiors and still life as well. Um, and this was from a series called Home, which is documenting long haul lorry cabs um, and the interiors of their, um, when I say lorry cabs, I mean the front end of the lorry, the bit that the driver sits in. Um, and this series was selected for the Royal Photographic Society. Uh, was it selected? It was shortlisted for the Royal Photographic Society IP, which is their International Photography Exhibition. Um, and for this, um, I had an idea that I wanted to photograph lorry interiors as I'd seen some on a documentary. And I was just absolutely wowed by the fact that lorry drivers go to such great extremes to make a very small space into a perfect home for all their really long journeys. And I thought to myself, how can I possibly find a large amount of lorry cabs in one space that look amazing? And then I stumbled across something called Truck Fest. Now there's a music festival called Truck Fest. It's not that, this is actually a festival for lorries that people who are into lorries go to throughout the UK. Um, and I was pregnant at the time and I came home one day and told my partner, I'm gonna go and drive myself to Cheshire on my own so I can just go and get into lots of lorry cabs and take pictures. And the look on his face was not, probably not, he probably didn't 100% trust what I was going to do, but I think he's been, long, been with me long enough to know that I generally head off and do, do things when I've got an idea in my head. Um, so yeah, this involved me basically entering people's homes, but they were also there, you know, as a lorry. Um, and in that, there's a certain vulnerability in that because before entering somebody's lorry cab, you have to ask permission and you have to build up a bit of a rapport. And whilst you need to stand there, you know, I arrived at this festival and I had never met anybody before in my life. And there's me with a, you know, granted a small camera and I probably didn't look like much of a threat because I was pregnant and female and you know had a very small camera shooting it on my old Canon AE1 which is like a very basic 35 mil camera from the 70s just with some onboard flash um, but yeah you have to break down barriers before you can enter somebody's very small home um, so yeah and I think what helps in those situations is again, as I said before, remembering that people are not two-dimensional strangers. They are three-dimensional beings. And if you can find a level with them, if you can find a sort of certain empathy, um, and if you can find a, show them your gratitude and your joy and help them in some way by, you know, saying, hey, I'm gonna send you these images when they're done and I'll just double check them past you. Or if you can, show 
that you are being authentic and you're not just turning up to take a few snaps and you're just going to stick them on your Instagram. There's perfectly, you know, a, that's a valid choice in itself. But again, making choices that are within line with your values and treating people how you would wish to be treated yourself. And generally that goes down pretty well. Um, but like I said, a few years ago, I might not have turned up to that situation with such thought I might have turned up and been more about the idea, the idea, the idea I've got to get done. And actually with a lot of, you know, amazing documentary photographers, it's the stuff leading up to the moment of the photograph that is the real work. The actual photograph itself is just the icing on the cake. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but um, mm. yeah. How do you avoid having a, um, just like a, a blackout? You know, because obviously, if you if you need to if you put yourself into a position where you need to improvise, um, you know, uh, you let go basically of the of the the element of control to a certain degree, and that comes with a danger. Obviously, that you know, sometimes you could literally be losing the plot yeah. because you know, because the uh, I don't know, as as you said, you know, photography is a very particular. If you work on location. It means there are so many elements to juggle in comparison, for example, to pure um, uh, studio shoots. Yeah, there's so many things to 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 consider. Um, how do you make sure that you stay on track? Do you have like a little like a little note that you check on the back <laughs> of the camera, or do you like to work with someone who reminds you? Do you work with an assistant? Sure. So when I'm doing commercial works, so you know, we we lost the screen share. <laughs> hang on I'm coming back here we go boom there we go um, um can you see that now nope oh interesting try this yep. that. um yeah so your question do i have an assistant yes so i work with assistants definitely when um, budget permits, which is generally most of the commercial work that I do. And even on things like, um, you know, corporate shoots where I'm doing headshots, there's still basically things that I want to make sure that I get out of the shoot. Um, so before a shoot, I might say, to, I'll, I'll definitely give my assistant a, a call the day before and say, this is what we're gonna do. Um, these are the things I'm concerned about. These are the things I would like you to keep an eye out for if you can remember. Like it's not your job 100% to do my job for me, but it'd be great to have an extra pair of eyes on things like um, if we're shooting in quite quick conditions, things like sharpness. Um, so if we're shooting into computer using uh, Capture One, I know you guys train on Lightroom, so it's the same thing, shooting tethered into that. I want to make sure that you know the majority of shots we're getting are technically good and if somebody else is looking out for that that just means that we've got double the amount of eyes on it um, we want to make sure that we're capturing the things that the client has asked for you know they might have said we want a full length shot we want a medium shot we want a close-up shot we want one where they've got their uh, boots new boots on we've got one where they've got um, this particular top on uh, we want one that's in nature, we want one that's indoors. So we're sort of keeping, we're keeping maybe a, a written list, but also we're keeping a mental list of, are we getting everything that the client wants? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we're also showing the client, them, you know, often we're going through everything with the client as we're shooting it, because we want to be as vulnerable as we can on the shoot with the client. If we walk into a shoot and start shooting and don't let the person the creative director or the commissioner see what we're doing or we'll speak to them about it they're going to hate it they're absolutely going to hate it this is their money this is their project this is their baby and we are trying to um, imagine we're trying to create their vision so we want to be as candid as we can now we're not going to stand there and go oh do you know what I'm really worried about the fact that um, I'm not doing a very good job right now we're not going to be that candid <laughs> because that's not going to get as many places um, we're not going to stand there and tell them about all the ins and outs of our lives there's a certain level to which we are candid and vulnerable with them however if we are able to have a dialogue again with 
the client with our assistant with um there might be a stylist on set there might be a makeup artist if we can constantly be having conversations where we're talking openly and as honestly as doesn't harm people um we're going to have a better group direction mm. as opposed to me just coming in having my ideas not talking to anybody bang 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 the client's not happy the assistant is baffled the makeup artist feels like her work hasn't been seen properly the stylist is just like not interested you know everyone comes away with kind of a bad taste in their mouth so mm. I think I've just answered your question in a very long-winded it again it's about dialogues and being as creative as possible um and having being true to yourself whilst also having empathy for others around you and trying to also tick things off on lists now that's in the commercial world how do I stay on track when I'm doing my own projects if I'm working on my own I don't know <laughs> is the answer um if it's a if it's a commission and I'm just out there with a camera and I you know I'm often checking the back of the camera they call it chimping don't they like looking at the back of the camera looking at the back of the camera but it's good you, you need to double check what's going on and if you're shooting on film um you need to keep an idea of like what film stock am I using am I using the right film stock for the right light where am I how many of the frames have I shot of this film stock when am I going to run out is it going to be during a portrait if I've got a flow going with somebody I want to make sure that I'm not running out of film just as I you know if I've got one shot left I'm probably going to change the film before I go into that so just little things like that um of the of this truck series on the web page Say that again, what about the truck series? Yeah. Can you show us um, some more pictures? It would be really interesting to see, to hear like the, um, the, the end of the story going, you know, like get, getting in touch with those truck drivers. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. So um, I ended up shooting quite a few of the truck drivers' um, cabs and I only ended up using three. Um, so I only ended up speaking to three of the um, truck drivers at the back end of it. Um, but yeah, there are lots of um, documentary projects. I'll show you, let's go to this one here actually. So, so this shot here, can you see me wiggling my uh, cursor over it? And this one here and this one here. And we'll go to this one here, it's a nice example. So this is from um, a series I shot called Passion 202, um, which was documenting Japanese love hotels. This is not a project where I came back to the love hotels to show them the work. I suspect some of them were run by the Yakuza um, and I suspect some of them were run by people that wouldn't take kindly to me. Um, uh, what's the word? Being completely candid with what I'd done. Um, I actually, I don't know, for those who do know what a Japanese love, I'll, I'll explain it anyway. In, in Japan, a lot in Tokyo, there are love hotels. Um, in Japan, lots of people live within very sort of, you know, small confines, there's big built up cities, people don't have a lot of space. Um, older sort of teenagers, young adults often live at home with their parents until quite late. There's not that much space to be intimate with people, you know, you, so they have love hotels, which you hire by the hour or by the night. They're just designed so you can go and, you know, have some special time with your, with your loved one. And they're very, very normal and everywhere throughout um, Japan. And for some reason, I think it was a, a project that I did with um, my now partner, um, which was a music project, but we ended up photographing a Japanese love hotel in Tokyo. And some of that work, um, we won the um, AOP uh, best series, open series. And it kind of got me thinking like, there's a lot of love hotels and a lot of the decor is quite interesting. And I'd love to go and do a project. So the next time we were visiting Japan, which was a, a year or so later, I said to Derwin, my partner, because you have to be in a two, a two people to go and hire these love hotels. And I wasn't going to tell them I was going to photograph it. So I had to pretend I was, we were going there. So basically I have um, 
the situation where we hired this love hotel and we hired about 10 or 11, I think I needed to get all the images. It's about a 30 image series. Um, and yeah, we turned up and pretended we were going to use the love hotel. And then I would just get into the love hotel and start photographing. And, and these are some of the interiors. I don't have the whole, um, the whole one here, but this is, as you'll see, like they're quite, again, this is shot on film. Um, it was shot on the Canon, uh, a1 the onboard flash so I wanted to sort of approach it with a very forensic uh, approach like documenting everything as I found it kind of thing and a lot of the the decor and the interiors are just so chintzy and outdated and very 60s 70s um, kind of gross like places like not the sort of place that fills you with like you know here's like a, a leather seat with like a bit of old like manky gross tape putting it back together and there's like you know there's a lot of stuff I'll send you a link so that um all your sort of listeners and watchers can can have a look uh, properly but you know there's stains everywhere um and so yeah this was an example of where it wasn't really appropriate for me to then to be a hundred percent candid with the places that I was photographing for fear of like, there was one time where um, uh, I tried, I went with a female um, friend of mine in Japan because she said, oh, I'll come and help you. Cause my partner didn't want to come to like a hundred love hotels and just sit there. Um, but yeah, they wouldn't in some of them. And I guess this is like, I guess it's because of their ideas about LGBTQ relationships. They wouldn't let me and another female um, enter the room together. So there was quite a few, like very, uh, what's the word? Eye-opening experiences that we had along the way. Um, so yeah, it's not always 100% appropriate to be completely honest, or honest is the wrong word, candid. Um, but yeah, as you can see, there are lots of really weird places you can visit um, and this is one of them. <laughs> um, so yeah, I had a few, um, that series won a few awards in 2018. Um, and I know you wanted to talk a little bit about awards and kind of that, that kind of thing. So maybe we could chat about that a bit. Um, I don't mean, I don't know. I'm going to ask you, what do you think about entering awards? <laughs> um, uh, well, the, so in my earlier career, I, I entered a lot of awards and um, because I thought it was a fantastic way to have your name published, to get out there, uh, just to be recognized. And uh, so I won a few and the, I was literally like, literally as a young photographer, I was literally uh, sitting next to the to the telephone after winning one of those awards waiting for all those uh you know fantastic jobs to come in <laughs> yeah. obviously just nothing happened <laughs> and uh, so you know i had a, a few experiences in a row and then i decided okay definitely like there might not actually be like a, a breakthrough element or breakthrough moment for my career nevertheless i think that in the long run uh they definitely give you recognition, for example, when I then made portfolio appointments and someone would always say, oh, hang on, you took that picture. I've seen this before. Didn't you win this and that award? Uh, so it, I, I do think, it, in fact, it, it is important. Um, but um, I remember we met before and we discussed how the jury process actually works. And I think it's slightly, it's slightly, um, let's say it's a, it's a slightly sobering idea or kind of knowledge to, to know how this works so that they're actually looking for the smallest common denominator. So that means that everybody in the jury would actually have their favorites or their, their first choice, and then they can't agree. So then they need to, everybody needs to compromise. And that already means like normally no one's first choice actually makes it uh, because they all have different favorites. And uh, yeah, and then they basically like boil this down bit by bit and they try to, and everybody's compromising more and more just so that they ultimately can agree on one photographer. So, 
And yeah, it, I think that's the way it is. So in a lot of photography awards, unfortunately, not necessarily the best photograph wins. Um, yeah, so I've got some mixed emotions about that. Yeah. I know, yeah. I think it's the same though. And I think, I think if you ask most professional photographers what they think about awards, they would also have mixed emotions. Um, and I feel the same, like, I remember, yeah, winning my first, I guess the first accolade that I probably got was having an image accepted into the, um, into the blah, 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 National Portrait Gallery. Um, let me try and show you that one. I will share my screen when I have found it. Um, and yeah, I thought it was accepted into the, let me find it, you know, share the screen. So this is an image of um, David Rodigan, uh, MBE, who is a, a famous reggae DJ. And, um, and it's interesting how it came about that I had this accepted into the National Portrait Gallery collection. I, I had been putting together my portfolio, which is a very important thing to do. And it's also full of uncertainty and risk and emotional exposure, because when, as you know, you do a portfolio review of anybody, you're literally putting your babies in front of them and saying, judge me. It's, it can be quite scary, but it also is a really good process and it's important to do it. Um, and lots of people would always comment on this picture in particular. I happened to be changing out the, the pages of my portfolio and I literally had a, a spare print of it. And a friend of mine also works in photography. It's like, you can always send it for a, a consideration to be accepted into the National Portrait Gallery collection. I was like, that's ridiculous. Anyway, I had a spare print. I had nothing else to do with it. I wasn't gonna stick it on my wall at home. I sent it off to the, the guy at the National Portrait Gallery collection back then and they accepted it in. So I guess my point being is that from that moment, I realized that, oh, even people like me, like regular people can win awards. You just have to actually do it. Um, I have mixed feelings about awards also because um, I think they can be quite elitist, um, especially when you look at things like the, things like the DNAD, you know, the big sort of design advertising awards just to have one entry you're talking about hundreds of pounds just for one entry which is great for advertising companies because they've got that kind of money but for individuals like often photographers are individuals like we don't have huge amount of spare cash if any at all so things like that do make it elitist and and i think that's i think it's unfair when uh competitions do charge a lot of money and also like we said you it's quite a it's a very, um, it's, an, it's destabilizing sometimes to, to, to put your, your best work forward and then to, you know, some of the awards don't even give you a rejection email. You find out by seeing who's been shortlisted and, and that can be quite disheartening. Mm -hmm. The flip side being that when you do actually have, I don't know, something shortlisted or some kind of success, it is a heartening experience and sometimes whilst we might not have the, I don't know, like you say, you're not sitting up the phone and it's like off the hook and you can't stop the offers coming in. That doesn't happen. I, I don't know anyone that that's happened to. Maybe people who win Taylor Wessing or something like that, that might happen. They might get an agent and things might blow up for them. Um, but generally it's small, quiet things. Like it might open one door for you and that door might lead somewhere else it's a bit more ex i hate to use the word exposure don't work for exposure it doesn't work um people die from exposure but little bits of exposure here there and everywhere that come about from you know a product of your your own personal endeavors that can be a good thing so yeah it's a it's a mixture and you know it's a lottery as well mm. if we knew what was going to win there would be no point to it. So there's an actual element of letting go and that whole element of, I have no control over the outcome of this. Yeah. Um, let's say yeah. someone like you, I mean, you really have a lot of, uh, you won a lot of awards, you've got a lot of like short lists. Would you say that is an active, that you actively integrate this as part of your, let's say like your marketing strategy or is it just something you just do? Is it just a passion of yours? I think, 
I guess it is part of my business model now, if you want to call it that. I think to call my business model a business model is giving it more, cre <laughs> more, more credit than... <laughs> um, I think it's important and I don't necessarily do it all the time. It's a, it takes time, which is work, which is, you know, we don't have all that admin time just spare. Like it, um, and I think I do it more as a kind of, <clears throat> I've got to be in it to win it. I might as well have a chance. If I can afford to do it this month and there's something coming up, I will. Mm -hmm. If I can't afford to do it and I'm going to have to miss this one out, then I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Um, could you could you maybe show us on your webpage a few images, a few examples of uh, work that was shortlisted or... Yeah, sure. Um, so we saw that portrait of Britain, the, the Will Young one before. Um, Let's have a look through here. So yeah, this one here, David Rodigan, that was accepted into the um, the National Portrait Gallery collection. Um, and then a lot of the the ones I showed you earlier. So from this series again, the um, the Tokyo Love Hotel series. That one, a few of them. Um, I think that was. Let me just double check. So there was a, a an award. So the the stuff prior to this won the um, AOP Open Series. Uh, it was best in category for that. And then this also won something called the Photographic Analog Award. Um, the Independent Photographer Documentary Award was the editor's pick. Uh, the International Photography Award, Still Life Abstract, and got an honourable mention. There was a competition called Photography on a Postcard, which that uh, was the winner. I think the most, probably the one that um, maybe I'm most proud of, here we go, here's me, I'm naked. Um, <laughs> so I find it hard talking about this because it is me naked, but I guess it has special meanings, particularly in the context of um, vulnerability. And I use this as my, um, about my, my, my portrait on my website. It was selected um, for the 2019 Portrait Salon exhibition. So when it got selected, I kind of had to put it out there. I didn't have to, I could have kept it quiet, but I was definitely going to appear on a gallery somewhere naked. So I thought I might as well, might as well go for it. Um, I think personal work is really important and this is personal work. This was captured when I was 37 weeks pregnant. Um, and I had lots of sort of, there's a lot of meaning behind it for me personally because I found that people always project when you're pregnant people always project their own ideas onto you about what they think you should be when you're pregnant and I was doing a shoot one day and somebody said oh aren't you too pregnant to do this shoot and aren't you aren't you too big to do that and just you're just bombarded with it any woman who's been pregnant will probably say the same um, and I didn't really want to stick out I didn't want to be physically bigger um, at the beginning and then something changed and as I got bigger and bigger I kind of got okay with my body and I was like I want to document this so I thought I'll do a self-portrait and I went and entered it into yeah the portrait salon and then it, it got selected um, and so I guess for me it was sort of um, an exercise in being seen and seeing which is you know I'm literally taking a photograph of myself um, and the, my own female gaze onto my own female body, um, whilst letting everybody else look at my female body as well. Um, so yeah, it was it was a particularly, I don't know, there was something about, in terms of vulnerability and being authentic and having some self-compassion and being resilient um, whilst being creative and you know, trying to make meaningful work and um, trying to be a bit daring. I guess this ticks a lots of lots of boxes. Um, and I would just like to say I did not retouch really myself, but I was tempted to. <laughs> you, do you think you you are able to tell a I don't know, is there like a, something like a winning formula that you think that you can spot within? among awards, something, I don't know, some like certain criteria that make the cuts, let's say. For example, something that, that I notice is that we often 
photographs that are that are winning awards there very often they're not too complex pictures i feel very often they're quite um sometimes even minimalistic they're very focused yeah they speak very often in very clear visual language what's mm -hmm. your experience so some i well if i knew the winning formula i would be winning every award so no <laughs> but okay, there's a lot, i think we had this conversation before where there's a lot of sort of photographers out things like the taylor wessing people are like oh it's just ginger people or naked people that will win this and you know some of them are ginger maybe you should them. have handed it <laughs> taylor wessing portrait award well, exactly um the and, yeah <laughs> i think um yeah you can't possibly know the winning formula and i think tastes change constantly and i think what is meaningful in culture is constantly changing maybe not very quickly but you know if you if you have a look back through the years i'm sure the things that were winning competitions of many years ago are not the sort of things that would be winning it now so I wish there was a winning formula that I knew of, but I think there's still, that would be having control over it, wouldn't it? And we've got to let go of control. So I think those decisions are not to be made by us. We're sort of handing over our work to be seen. And if you can even just do that, that's, that's a brave act in itself. I think being daring and being brave with your work, particularly when it comes to things like awards or portfolios is really important. If yeah. we just did everything by the book, if we did everything to everybody else's tastes, it, it wouldn't work. And I think also as you're finding your, you know, I'm still finding my feet and my style, as as your students are finding their feet and their styles, you'll start you'll start to find what's important and what feels good, not just what looks good, but what feels good when you get more than just a it's more than just a visual thing you're looking at. It's a whole sense of what's going on in the image and that will influence your style and that will influence the places you go to and the places that you're drawn to because people who are interested in your work will be the people that you're interested in shooting for it's kind of this like mirroring process yeah. so yeah. yeah i don't know if that's answering that question absolutely absolutely <laughs> yeah i think personally the um, showing your work more often really helps you to edit it down i think oh, so yeah. um just by the, the act of showing it to other people to expose yourself, to lower your guard, even, yeah. if, even if the other people don't necessarily give you any sort of like particularly feedback, but mm -hmm. it's a way to look at yourself, I think. I think, I don't know if we discussed this briefly, but, you know, I said probably like before, that like, you know, it's the same thing as if you take your best friends to your hometown and you see your hometown for the very first time, uh, almost that kind of feeling you almost kind of see your hometown your old hometown with their eyes yeah. um it's that it's the element of kind of exposure of you know, exposing yourself or your surroundings um that ultimately helps you to look at yourself i think and to understand yourself better I think. yeah no absolutely i kind of when often when like new people to photography ask me for advice one of the things i always just tell them is keep showing people mm -hmm just keep showing eventually you know keep throwing enough shit at something and something will stick eventually you know and it, I, I say that kind of flippantly but it's also true like if you keep showing people work I mean an example is probably a good one to end on maybe I'll show you now where is it is it in this one this a few years ago I used to volunteer at a lunch club for the elderly um, mm -hmm. I just did it because it was something nice to do and you need to be able to see my screen <laughs> just about to the like, last shot and I remember to do it you know, like some sort of like a, like a sign language and go like, like this. can you see that now yeah I can see it okay so this is a lady at, um so yeah I used to volunteer at a lunch club and one day I said um, to the people who ran the lunch club, can I come and take some photographs? I'm a photographer. And they said, yes. And I took this one. Um, this was shot on film. As you can see, I just put it on my website and maybe I did. I, I think I put it in my portfolio and I, I put it on Instagram. I thought nothing else of it. It was just a nice picture of a nice moment of a nice lady and some nice colors in a nice place that I'd volunteered. 
years later, um, I got a phone call from somebody I used to work with in the music video industry, who now worked in the advertising industry and said, we've seen that picture. Um, and we were wondering if you'd like to come and shoot um, a campaign for um, about Bisto, which is obviously like a sort of gravy company. Let me see if I can find the shot that got used from that. It might not be on my website actually. Mm. Anyway, the point being is that they had seen one picture that I had felt, you know, really strongly about, but didn't really have any sort of, you know, it wasn't really, it wasn't from a corporate thing. It wasn't from anywhere in particular. I just really felt, you know, felt something for it. Somebody remembered that. They came to me a few years later from like, you know, McCann, which is like a good advertising agency and said, can you come and do some pictures on, a, on an advertising campaign? It just goes to show that people remember things that mean something to them. Um, and I think if you can have a few of those where people, you know, something resonates with somebody, it might not happen overnight, but a couple of years down the line, somebody will come out of the blue and be like, I remembered you photographed that tractor in, you know, 2021 and it's now 2025 and we're doing it, we're doing something about tractors. So keep showing people work is important. Um, even if it feels a bit icky and yeah just to go back to that meaning of vulnerability it's uncertainty and risk and emotional exposure and it feels unstable to step out of your comfort zone but if you can learn to kind of feel the ickiness and do it anyway it's often really beneficial not always but sometimes mm -hmm. super Thank you so much. So I hope the our students are going to take a lot of encouragement out of this. Uh, it's absolutely true. The um, it is so much about as a creative person, you're not a uh, you know someone who like a, like a, you know works through some sort of like logical equations. It's all you and it's all your vulnerability. And there's this element of um, unpredictability and the the element of yeah that just a few things, particularly if you work with people that just simply can't be organized and I think, or can be, can't be controlled. I think that's ultimately what also makes photography so incredibly exciting. Mm. Uh, because once you achieve this, there's nothing better like it. Thank you so much for your lovely talk. Um, Thank you. Good, let's stay in touch. I wish you all the best and uh, lots of photography award wins for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, just to let you know, um, the next talk is going to happen on the uh, last, so on the first Friday of next month. Uh, so hope to see you again soon. And remember that you can see the recording of this talk on our webpage, lrp.co.uk. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. <laughs>